Right, we're ready to start. Um, so can I welcome members to the 28th uh, meeting in 2017 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Um, Alison Harris has submitted her apologies. Uh, can I welcome uh, Bill Bowman to the meeting as a substitute? Uh, can I also welcome Michael Russell, uh, Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe and his officials to the meeting? Um, so the first item on our agenda is declaration of interests uh, in accordance with section 3 of the Code of Conduct. Can I invite Bill Bowman to declare any interests relevant to the remit of the committee? Uh, thank you, Convener. I have nothing to add other than what is in my register of interests. Okay. Uh, agenda item 2 is decision on taking business in private. It's proposed the committee takes items 8, 9 and 10 in private. Uh, those items are the delegated powers provisions in the Social Security Scotland Bill, the contents of the committee's report to the Education and Skills Committee on the delegated powers in the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill, and consideration of the evidence it will hear from the Minister, uh, Scottish Environment Link and RSPB on the European Union Withdrawal Bill. Does the committee agree to take these items in private? Okay, so we'll move on to agenda item three, the European Union Withdrawal Bill. Um, so we're considering... Uh, yeah, so can I ask um, uh, the Minister if he'd like to make some quick opening remarks? Very, very briefly, Leader, and thank you for the invitation to be here. I know you will have plenty of questions, but simply to stress one important point. Uh, we are very keen uh, to differentiate between the technicalities of leaving the EU, uh, which require the withdrawal bill at Westminster to be enacted, and the policy of leaving the EU with which we profoundly disagree. Um, but insofar as our questioning uh, today is concerned, uh, focusing on the bill, then what we're trying to do is to find a, a essentially a modus vivendi with Westminster uh, in order to take this issue forward. It's been difficult and it remains difficult, but the uh, JMCEN meeting which was held last uh, Monday in London made some progress on the issue of frameworks which are covered in Clause 11 of the Bill, and I'm happy to speak about that if questioned about it. So I just want to make that distinction because um, I don't think it would be a good use of any of our time if we were to be involved in the second issue at this stage as this committee is focused on the first issue, which is the technicalities and getting the legislation right. Um, well, thanks, Minister. You're absolutely right. We're not concerned here with, uh, with the policy uh, rather than uh, the technicalities. Um, um, can, I, can I just ask you to outline your, your general concerns uh, about the bill? Uh, they lie in two areas. I mean, there are many concerns, and you know, quite clearly there are things in the bill which uh, many of us would take exception to, and it's the subject of, I think, over 300 amendments at Westminster so far. But early on, we decided that, uh, along with the Welsh government, uh, with whom we've been working very closely on this matter, that there were two principal areas of concern. Now, this arose after <coughs> failing to see the bill during its drafting, which would be normal for a bill that had required a legislative consent motion. There would be a process between officials who would discuss the bill and make sure the bill was in a, a form in which legislative <coughs> consent could be given. That didn't take place on this occasion. So when we were shown the bill, which I think was at the very beginning of July, um, with the bill due to be published in the middle of July, we uh, expressed extreme concern over two issues, as a result of which I met with David Davis the following week, but we couldn't persuade the UK government, nor could the Welsh, to make changes to the bill at that stage. And these two areas are as follows. Firstly, Clause 11, which takes the powers that exist in the EU to do with devolved areas, this so-called list of 111 items, and transfers those to Westminster rather than to the devolved parliaments. Uh, and that is unacceptable <laughs> as far as we're concerned. And I think there's been a broad level of agreement that that is unacceptable across a range of political parties. And that's an ongoing issue. And the second one is to do with the so-called Henry VIII powers. Now, we have concerns about the exercise of those powers and the breadth of those powers, and no doubt we'll come on to that. But there is a specific issue with those powers in terms of the powers that are given to Scottish ministers. They are different uh, from the powers given to UK ministers. And the powers given to UK ministers include the ability to change Scottish legislation 
without consultation with the Scottish Parliament uh, or the Scottish Government, mm -hmm. and that would be unacceptable to us. So those are the two principal areas of concern. We can talk about a variety of other issues which we find difficult, but in our approach to this, we decided, very unusually, to prepare joint amendments with the Welsh Government. It's the only time it's happened, the only time we've ever jointly proposed amendments to a Westminster Bill, focused on the areas of most concern. Uh, other matters, the individual political parties, Labour, uh, the Liberals, the SNP, Plaid, the Green MP, have all brought forward amendments to the Bill, as have some Tory MPs. But those ones are the ones which we have focused on, and those amendments have been tabled in the House of Commons with the support of all the opposition parties. Okay. Can I ask <coughs> you um, a, a little about uh, this meeting uh, last week, where, where there was a statement came out about common frameworks, um, which I must say I found, personally found quite, quite positive that there had been such a statement. Um, so I take it, I mean, you were party to that. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> you accept that <coughs> there needs to be common frameworks. I've accepted there needed to be common, some common frameworks since we published Scotland's Place in Europe last December. The issue is not frameworks. The issues are who decides on what subjects those should be required, um, how those frameworks are governed, and how decisions are made as a result of those frameworks. Those are the issues, not the frameworks. Uh, you know, there are some things which we will not need frameworks for, both sides agree. There are some things that we're likely to need some frameworks of some sort. But those can't be imposed, and they have to have an element of co-decision making. If you're dealing with matters that are devolved to the uh, Scottish Parliament, then the Scottish Parliament is not going to give those up. It could choose to share decision-making in those matters, mm. but then the UK would have to decide that they were going to do that as well. So that's the issue. The positive nature of last week's meeting was that we managed to agree on the principles uh, which would guide our decision-making. We are then moving on to look at exemplars in the, a number of areas, agriculture, um, the legal one, um, yeah, uh, Justice and Home Affairs. Justice and Home Affairs. And the Welsh Government has asked for something on food labelling uh, because they don't deal as much with Justice and Home Affairs as we do. We will then look at those as exemplars to see if we could agree a governance structure. So we've made a, a small step forward, but we are genuinely trying to make that step. But we could not, and I, I stress this again, we could not bring a legislative consent motion at the present time because we could not consent to the bill as drafted, <coughs> and particularly Clause 11. <coughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm just going to ask you, I'm, I'm going to read a bit out from this statement um, mm -hmm. and see if you can help me here. Um, it, I'll just read it. Frameworks will respect the devolution settlements and the democratic accountability of the devolved legislatures with, and will therefore be based on established conventions and practices, including that the competence of the devolved institutions will not normally be adjusted without their consent. What, do you th what does that phrase mean, not normally? Um, as far as we're concerned, it means it will not be adjusted without our consent. The word normally was applied in the last Scotland Act, if I'm correct, uh, with regard to the Sewell Convention. The expectation then was that it would be a binding commitment by Westminster. It turned out rather unfortunately, and I don't want to be too unkind about this, that uh, the Advocate General made much of the word normally during the Supreme Court hearings yeah, yeah. to say that it was a meaningless word and it had no meaning whatsoever. Now, that was a foolish thing in my view, view and I've made that clear in other circles too, because it undermined confidence in a relationship which should have an element of trust in it. But if one party puts words into an agreement and then turns around and says, Yabu, they don't mean anything, then that diminishes that trust. So as far as I'm concerned, the agreement that we reached last week, as well as the Welsh uh, reached last week, means that the devolved <coughs> settlement, there will be no change in the devolved settlement without the consent of the devolved administrations. Were that not to be the case, we would go back to where we have been, which is an inability to communicate on these matters. So uh, I take it to mean that we have an agreement that we're going to behave properly, respectfully and trustfully to each other and move forward to try and find a way to get a solution. Okay, that's very helpful. Let's uh, hope that's the case. Um, so we've got some uh, set questions here which we'll just...
work our way through, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so the bill confers wide powers on UK and devolved ministers to correct, correct, correct retained EU law. Um, are these powers clearly expressed in your view? Well, they, they are expressed <coughs> in terms which are understandable. Whether these terms actually need further refinement will be a, an issue to be discussed. Um, for example, the, the broad power, one could ask, are the powers necessary? Um, no power should be broader than it needs to be. Um, we need to make sure that the powers cannot be used to enable ministers to make significant policy changes, for example. That's not the intention of the bill. The intention of the bill is to make the changes that are necessary or, or appropriate in terms of the bill, but we might, one might come on to that issue between the two words. We will. Uh, we want, want to make sure that the bill is used to do those things that require to be done. There's no doubt that this exercise is unique. It's in huge in scale. It, you know, it, by unique, I mean never been done before, as a result of which we will have to do things which haven't been done before. But we need to be very, very cautious that we're not then using the opportunity to do things that shouldn't be done. I, you know, I use, for example, the way in which the bill has been drafted. Some would interpret the bill as being used uh, as a backdoor means to reduce the powers of the devolved uh, administrations. That's not what it should be used for. And therefore, at its very heart, we would object to that. <coughs> is that do you, do you think that's the case? I think that's how it looks. Yeah. I know that the assurance I've had the assurance from the first secretary, for example, that that's not the case. But I do think that's how it looks, and I do hope we can come to an agreement that removes those parts of the bill. Um, and certainly, that is also the position of the, the Welsh, uh, who have taken a very strong line, as we have, that we are not going to allow that to happen. As as you said earlier, there's been. Uh, cross-party uh, support hmm? for, for that view. Absolutely. Uh, every party. And, and absolutely convenient. I'm happy to say that the parties have been meeting in the Parliament, as you know, um, and the Conservatives have been were at the last meeting, and I'm glad that they're involved in that way. Yeah. OK. Uh, the committee's heard from witnesses that there are problems with the breadth of the powers, and in particular the wide reach of the term deficiencies. At the same time, uh, we recognise that deficiencies must arise from the UK's withdrawal from the EU in order to fall within the scope of the correcting power. Uh, how do you think the powers could be improved? Well, there's a number of ways. I mean, we've not <coughs> we've focused our attention, and, and I want to, to make that clear again. We've focused our intention on two deficiencies in the bill, which re we require to have remedied before we can give legislative consent. There's a ra broader range of views on deficiencies which Westminster MPs are bringing forward to amend. Uh, you know, for example, the um, definition of deficiency is, is unlimited. But there is illustration given, as you know, in Clause 7.2. And those examples demonstrate the range of ways in which law will be inoperable as a consequence of leaving the EU. So in those circumstances, there is an illustration given of what the problem is and then the application of the solution to that problem. Uh, there are parts of this bill where that doesn't happen, where there is no examples given at all. Mm -hmm. Those are harder uh, to interpret. Uh, on a general point, convener, I don't think we object to this having to be done. I mean, we don't want it to be done, and I make that policy point. Yeah. But we don't object to it having to be done. We just want it to be done in the best and most efficient way possible without unintended or intended adverse co consequences. Okay. Now, I'll just ask you. I'll ask you a final question for now, um, because you've mentioned it. Um, would you support calls to make the powers available only where necessary to correct deficiencies in retained EU law, rather than where considered appropriate? And we we've taken evidence yeah. on this already. I know. Um, Appropriateness, of course, is often used, including in our own legislation, so the meaning of it is easier to come to. But no powers exercised in this bill, I suppose in any bill, but particularly in this bill, should be capable of being used to make significant policy changes. So I suppose the word necessary is narrower and perhaps more appropriate in that scope. Yeah. So I, I'm not unsympathetic to that. I don't think I would take a firm view at this moment. But I can see 
that if we are trying to make sure that this bill is not abused accidentally or deliberately, then the word necessary might be a better word. Yeah, although both words uh, allow for some flexibility. Yeah, necessary probably defines it more narrowly, and therefore by defining it more narrowly, perhaps uh, allows a, a degree of confidence to be gained in how the powers might be used. Okay. Stuart. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the question regarding the sunset clauses, um, do you... Uh, do you think that the sunset clauses which apply to the powers in the bill are the right ones, or, or should the powers lapse earlier, for example, uh, on exit day? Well, I have no firm view on sunset clauses in terms of most of the bill. I mean, that will be a matter for amendment and discussion at Westminster. Where I don't think a sunset clause would create, create a difference, and this has been raised, of course, would be in case of, of, of Clause 11 of the bill. I think the Law Society of Scotland is amongst the bodies of suggesting the possibility of a sunset clause on Clause 11, that is, for the powers being transferred. It doesn't seem to me it cures the problem. If the problem is, as, as I've defined the problem this morning, who makes the decisions and how those decisions are made, then you know, the fact that those decisions would stop being made by the wrong people and in the wrong way after a period of time doesn't actually get to the root of the problem, which is to make sure that doesn't happen at all. So I, I, I'm not unsympathetic to limiting powers, but I don't think in this case it makes much difference. As for the other sunset powers, I think that would be up for others to say. Yeah. And uh, do you think that the, the constitutional statutes, such as the Scotland Act 1998, uh, should be or would be capable of amendment or repeal and regulations made under the bill? No, um, because the, the, there should be a further restriction of the powers in clauses 7, 8 and 9 because uh, not, uh, the, the ability to amend the Northern Ireland devolution statute is, is explicitly referred to in the bill. It's not possible to do that. I cannot see why. Well, I can see why, but I don't think it's right that there is no power to amend the Northern Ireland devolution statute, but power would remain to amend the Welsh and Scottish statute. No, and indeed we have made that absolutely clear. Uh, and uh, this morning you've already touched upon uh, Clause 11 uh, on, uh, on a few occasions. And uh, certainly also Clause 11 of the Bill uh, provides for the, the process by ordering Council uh, to allow for amendment of retained EU law where that is otherwise restricted at the point of exit from the EU. Uh, the process is similar to that already provided for in Section 30 uh, of the Scotland Act 1998 to make modifications to Schedules 4 and 5 of that uh, legislation. Uh, orders in Council uh, under Clause 11 uh, will be subject to the affirmative procedure and subject to joint scrutiny in Westminster and also uh, this Parliament. Uh, do you agree that uh, such a procedure by order in Council is the appropriate one? Uh, no, because I don't agree with uh, Clause 11. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it is chicken and egg here, if you'll, if you'll allow me to say so. I think that Clause 11 is unacceptable. We don't want it in the bill. We can't give consent to the bill while it remains there, and that's absolutely clear. Yeah, it is modelled on Section 30 of the Scotland Act, which provides for adjustment of reserve matters, but this is not an adjustment of reserve matters. This is a clear point of principle that at the time of withdrawal, uh, the powers should come to the Scottish Parliament. That is also consistent with the political arguments at the time. You, you know, um, the, the campaign, the Leave campaign, made much of the fact that these powers would come directly to Scotland. So it is not only breaking that political promise, but there's also something quite wrong about it. And it's confusing the process of devolution. You know, and at its heart, this is the core problem. Uh, devolution is, is built upon a simple foundation, that, that those matters that are not reserved are devolved. Now, that's been you know, the founding principle. It's worked very well. This clouds that. In fact, it contradicts it. Some matters would become reserved and evolved. It's not a, a good, workable way forward. It's wrong constitutionally. The bill should not have been drafted in this way, and we want it removed. And that is a common position with Wales. It is also the position across the political parties in Scotland. So I do hope that that will prevail. I mean, there's no harm in people saying, look, we didn't get that right, we're just going to take this out and do something different. And that's exactly what we would want to, to happen. I mean, certainly further to that, uh, obviously the Delegated Powers and Regulatory uh, Law Reform, sorry, the Regulatory Reform Committee and the House of Lords, uh, they also have a, a similar position regarding mm. that Clause 11. Uh, it is very hard to find anybody who supports Clause 11, except, uh, I have to say, the, the current go government. I've not heard the argument put... Um, that this is the right thing to do, and indeed all the examinations have taken place of it have indicated that it shouldn't be there. Uh, 
So, I mean, you know, given the consensus, and the consensus, as the convener has pointed out, across this parliament, which exists on this, I think there's an overwhelming case for it to be removed and for this to proceed in a more sensible way. Uh, uh, in order uh, for that aspect to uh, proceed, uh, what uh, alternative process uh, would you suggest um, to this committee that it could actually be considered? Well, you know, where we are at the moment in discussions indicate that with the removal of Clause 11, um, then there, there are a range of ways in which cooperation can take place on frameworks, some of which already exist. You know, there's already legislative co cooperation on issues. Uh, memoranda of understanding are another way. Um, joint working is another way. In those areas where it requires legislative underpinning, and it may require it, for example, in the area of agriculture, which would replicate what the Council of Ministers structure is now, then we are very keen to discuss how that would work. Uh, so that there is co-decision making, and I go back to that word again. There needs to be, in, in areas which have legislative underpinning, a co-decision making process. Now, you know, we can envisage that very clearly, and in actual fact, the um, Welsh Government published a paper in June, uh, I think it was in June, on, on these issues, which looked at possible structures. Now, you know, we, we think it's a helpful contribution, it's not necessarily the final word on these matters, but there are lots of models, and that's what we're trying to scope with the UK government and with, with the Welsh government in, through the JMC process to make sure that we understand how they would work, to build trust and confidence in them working. And if we can do that, then we can get an agreement. Okay, thank you. Bill Bowman. Thank you, Morning. Um, I'd like to move to devolved authorities' powers. And again, we may have touched on this already. Um, the committee has noted that the Scottish ministers have no power under the bill to modify retained direct EU legislation. It has been suggested in evidence to this committee that it would give rise to legal uncertainty if four sets of governments in the UK were able to modify direct EU legislation. For example, it would make it very difficult to identify what retained EU law was with a potentially detrimental effect on the continuity which the bill aims to provide for. What would be your response to that? Well, I think I'd have two responses to that. One is to say I think the concept of retained EU law is a pretty strange one anyway, uh, in the way in which the bill applies, because it's bound to atrophy, it's, it's bound to, 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 to die away, and in dying away, it's going to be difficult sometimes to read the runes of it to find out what is and isn't there. So I think that that's not a way we would have gone about this, but we are where we are. On the second point, you know, devolution is predicated upon the issue of subsidiarity, where the right places for decisions to make. And the fact that those decisions may be different in each place is not a reason not to do it. In fact, you know, unless you reject devolution in its entirety, then what you will have is a variation and a pattern of provision. And there's no reason why that shouldn't be the case. It can be well dealt with. Um, if there are to be frameworks, then those frameworks can deal with those areas in which some uh, certainty is required because there is a European equivalent. You know, for example, in, in, in agriculture, we can use agriculture as an example. But actually, there's also diversity in the agricultural provision. Because there is a degree of diversity in how things are delivered, you will see, for example, that um, less favoured area payments exist in Scotland, uh, don't exist in the vast majority of England. So there are differences in the way things are done. That doesn't actually affect or change the way in which agriculture is understood within these islands and people can practice you know, their business. So I don't think having difference is necessarily a problem, particularly if there is coordination. And we've always agreed on coordination through a variety of mechanisms. And I've indicated the convener you know, just a few moments ago what those mechanisms are. You can go from the very loosest type of coordination, which simply is a recognition of difference, uh, perhaps with a memorandum of understanding, right through to legislative coordination through agreed structures. So I think it's all possible to do. It's based on the approach to devolution that exists, and particularly if that approach is underpinned by a simple principle, that what's reserved is uh, uh, and what is devolved. And that's the problem with this bill. It confuses that principle. So you need the coordination to make that work? Where you need coordination, you should have it. You don't need it everywhere. There's already many areas where it doesn't take place. I mean, I know Damien Green used the example of um, a jam manufacturer in Dundee wanting to sell his uh, jam in um, Newcastle. Now, there's nothing in this bill 
uh, that either helps or hinders that. Mm -hmm. The reality is that with the present situation, there will be no difficulty in that jam manufacturer selling whatever he wants in Newcastle. It is actually the UK government that's going to make it more difficult for that jam manufacturer to sell it in Nantes rather than Newcastle, but that's another matter. Well, I recently bought um, Mackay's marmalade in Faro, so uh, <laughs> perhaps... Uh, well, I just hope you can continue to do so after 2019. Well, Staple <laughs> produce, I'm sure. <laughs> always happy to mention Dundee, anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let me move to a shorter question then. Are there powers available to UK ministers under the bill that you think should be, able, should be available to Scottish ministers? That's a very interesting question. Um, I think there are powers available to UK ministers which we cannot agree to, and that's one of the core issues, which is to change uh, Scot law in Scotland uh, without reference to the Scottish Parliament. Um, so I think one has to make sure that those powers are equalised. But I also think, and we may want to come on to this in more detail later, I also think we need a mechanism to make sure that these powers, if they are to be exercised by Scottish ministers, are subject to appropriate scrutiny uh, and control by the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and therefore, we need a mechanism to do that. That's why uh, my officials are in contact with and talking to parliamentary officials to try and find the way in which we can do that. I indicated, that, I think, as you know, in the statement I gave to the Scottish Parliament on the 20th uh, of September that I'm entirely happy uh, for those to be found. I indicated it in evidence to the, 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 the Finance and Constitution Committee, and we are now putting forward constructive ideas about what those powers should be. So I think, um, and that's paralleled by views at Westminster of the powers to UK ministers, I think that these powers require a, a degree more scrutiny than this bill gives them. Well, maybe just a... a sort of an aspect of that. I believe there's no procedure which allows Scottish ministers to make regulations urgently, although there is such a procedure available to the UK ministers. Yes, I, I think one would require to have some evidence uh, to hand that those powers were actually required, and I think that's probably the needed the emergency procedure issues um, may be necessary in Westminster terms. We don't know as yet. There's no illustrations given. Um, I think it would be, if they are necessary in Westminster terms and we can have that proved to us, then maybe that amendment should be made to the, the bill. But we don't really know that at the present moment. So would you suggest that Scottish ministers should have that? I don't think I'm in a position to do that because I don't think we know precisely what these powers are and how they're going to be exercised. But if they were to be proved to us by Westminster ministers and through the usual official channels that there was a likelihood of these being used and there was a necessity for them to be used, then I think it would be appropriate for Scottish ministers to be able to exercise them in Scotland in the way that UK ministers would exercise them in the rest of the UK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stuart, again. So you mentioned a few moments ago regarding the co-decision mm -hmm. um, making and certainly the bill provides the choice of three different uh, routes uh, to be exercised uh, in terms of the powers of uh, correction, uh, i.e. regulations made by the UK ministers acting alone, the regulations made by the devolved authorities acting alone and also regulations made jointly by the UK ministers and the devolved authorities. Uh, what factors uh, will determine the choice uh, of the route to be taken? Well, I, I think <laughs> it's intriguing, and I think we would only know that in the, the light of the issue that arose. But we've been clear that it's inappropriate for instruments to be made in relation to devolved Scottish legislation without the involvement of the Scottish Government or Parliament. That's the principle that we would apply. So we think one of those routes of being made by UK ministers without any consultation is not a route that should be followed. So you've, you remain, you know, there are two routes that then remain, co-decision making or individual decision making. On co-decision making, I think um, we would, there are areas that we presently have involvement in terms of joint legislative or joint administrative action. And we would apply those as required. I mean, those are areas which I suppose taking another, we don't have a means of legislative consent to secondary legislation here, but that does exist in Wales. I'm right in saying that? I, I think <laughs> this is this is therefore an ex cathedral pronouncement without support from <laughs> officials, which is dangerous. But I think there is a type of mechanism in Wales which allows um, legislative consent to secondary legislation because the Welsh uh, 
Parliament has dealt more with secondary legislation up until now than primary legislation. We don't have that procedure. So maybe one would require to develop that procedure to look at secondary legislation that had uh, was being altered by um, uh, joint decision making. In terms of our decision making, then it's quite clear those decisions are made, they should be scrutinised. The issue, which I've just been responding to Mr Bowman on, is how we would scrutinise that and what type of scrutiny we would develop here, which was perhaps stronger than the scrutiny being applied at Westminster. And we'll, we'll, work with, we'll work with the Parliament on those issues. Uh, we will obviously want to get those right. Um, Section 57.1 of the Scotland Act allows EU obligations to be implemented in devolved areas. That's an example of how we might work. Hmm. Sorry, Stuart and uh, Bill Bowman okay. are itching to come back. General, just, the, the sunshine is blinding me coming from the minister. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was a clarity of my argument that was making you look away, but there we are. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Sorry. I'm very rarely <laughs> accused of dazzling people, but thank you for that. <laughs> yes. right. but certainly, just on that uh, last point, uh, Minister, I mean, you spoke there regarding the, the, the Scottish Government would be, would be prepared to work with also the, the Scottish uh, Parliament. I mean, but certainly, how, how would you, the Government actually propose to account to the Scottish Parliament for its actions uh, in choosing uh, some of these uh, positions to take, and particularly in choosing the, if the UK Government uh, were to make provision in areas of devolved competence and also in giving consent? for that to happen? Well, I think what we're talking about, we go back to this issue of developing appropriate methods of scrutiny within this parliament that are acceptable to this parliament. I'm sure this committee would have a significant role in, in making sure that those were developed and implemented. And you know, we are presently having those discussions and bringing forward ideas. Uh, I, I mean, I'm very keen that we actually do that. Uh, there are lots of issues in there. Um, just to, to, to touch on one or two of them, there could be pre-laying, there could be flexible use of existing processes, there could be new scrutiny procedures, there could be modification of committee structures and sitting times. All of them are possibilities to create opportunities for increased scrutiny. Now, those are the things, and others, which are being put on the table in discussions. I think the appropriate place for this is discussions between government officials, Scottish Parliament officials, coming up with recommendations that both sides can support and taking that both through the government and the parliament processes. That would seem to be the right way to do it. Um, look. Uh, if I may, there, the Minister mentioned Section 57 of the Scotland Act, which is an existing example of the UK government being able to implement EU obligations in devolved areas. That is at present only done at an administrative level after bilateral consultation and with the agreement, the formal agreement of the Scottish uh, ministers. Scottish Government guidance on the use of this section requires that the relevant portfolio minister, when giving consent to the implementation of an obligation through Section 57, should write to the convener of the Scottish Parliament subject committee that deals with the subject matter, and also to the convener of the European and External Relations Committee. And at, at present, that is the mechanism by which ministers are held accountable for their decisions to agree to the use of Section 57 in that way. I expect that these will be the sort of mechanisms that are being discussed at official level between uh, government and parliamentary officials to cover the, the, the similar issue that's raised by the proposal in the Scottish Government, Welsh Government amendments that Scottish Minister's consent should be required before the UK Government can make regulations in devolved areas. Okay. Well, thank you. That's helpful. Can you, can you explain um, for, for the record for our uh, army of viewers out there uh, what, what, what Section 57 is? Sure. Uh, on devolution, most existing powers of the UK of UK ministers to make provision in devolved areas were lost, and those uh, powers were transferred to the Scottish ministers. Mm -hmm. What Section 57 does is it preserves the ability of UK ministers to continue to uh, implement EU obligations even in devolved areas. This is because an EU obligation applying the same way or very similarly between Scotland, England, between um, reserved and devolved matters will, would apply very similarly. Um, there's no parliamentary procedure provided for the use of Section 57 in the Scottish Parliament on the face of the bill, but in practice the Scottish Government, um, Scottish Minister's right, as I explained, to both subject matter conveners and to the European and External Relations Committee convener. And it is the, 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 it's that reporting mechanism that is used to hold ministers uh, accountable to the Parliament for the use of this power. Thanks very much. <laughs>
Right, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to uh, the point you've just been talking about, Mr Russell, which is par parliamentary scrutiny, which obviously this committee takes extremely seriously. Um, you've suggested that we might need to come up with uh, new, new procedures uh, to deal with this. Um, have, have you given any thought, um, or has the Scottish Government given any thought uh, to how it might enable uh, Parliament uh, to decide between using the negative or, or, or affirmative procedures uh, for regulations under the Bill? Well, on the practical nature of this, of what's coming down the line, you know, we, we, we're not yet entirely clear about the scale of the instruments that will be required. Um, or the divide between those that are best decided on a UK-wide basis and those that are best decided on a Scottish Parliament. So I don't think we're going to put in place anything at this stage that's too rigid or, or too elaborate on this. We have to have some more information. Um, and we don't want to tie ourselves necessarily to this decision until we see what's coming. Um, but what we can do is look at, at issue by issue and decide where they're going to work for us. Under Schedule 7 of the Bill as, in, as drafted, the affirmative procedure, procedure is dictated in certain circumstances. If the Bill is establishing a public authority, if it provides for the functions of an EU entity or public authority in a member state to be exercisable by a public authority in the UK, providing for the functions of a EU entity or public authority in a member state or making a legislative instrument to be exercised by a public authority, imposing a fee, creating or widening a scope of a criminal offence, or creating amending a power to legislate. So there's a set of criteria in the bill, in section, Schedule 7, that say how this decision should be made. Now, anything else should be subject to the negative procedure. We don't quite know the bulk of the work that will be coming through that can be judged by those criteria. So once we do know that, we'll be in a clearer position. It could be, given the development of the scrutiny procedures we're talking about, that we will want to apply further criteria ourselves um, in agreement with the Scottish Parliament that allows us to make this decision. So that's where we are at the present moment. I think as this develops over the next few months, we'll be in a clearer position. OK. And again, just for the record, um, the, the two procedures, affirmative and, and negative, allow for different levels of scrutiny by, yeah. by, by MSPs. Um, but essentially, it's uh, it's in your gift. It's in the government's gift to decide which. Uh, in the gift uh, defined by legislation, you know, because that legislation is clear. That clause is clear. If this bill passes, and of course, you know, I'm just making all the assumptions it will pass at Westminster. If this bill passes, then that makes it clear. There are other qualifications we might apply, which would widen the definitions, not narrow the definitions, but widen it. So uh, it is clear already what some of those will be. There may be more. Uh, the Lords um, have suggested that uh, you could set up a, a sifting committee to make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, would you be open to that idea well, here? Uh, sifting and, and, and pre-laying is one of the issues that we're discussing. Gerald might want to say a word or two about that. <clears throat> that's the sort of idea that's very much in the discussions that we're having with our opposite numbers from the Scottish Parliament, the clerks to, to this committee and others, uh, with an aim of finding a sort of pragmatic balance between the statutory requirements and procedures that give Parliament enough confidence that it is unable to scrutinise the instruments that it wants to in sufficient detail, um, recognising, I think, the potential volume that might be generated by this. So I think we, we are trying to, with the clerks, find a range of proposals, um, including the sort of idea that the Lords Committees have discussed, that would um, give this Parliament confidence that in exercising its scrutiny function it's sufficient opportunity to see what the government is doing in these areas. I say while recognising the potential volume that might come forward and, and recognising the need for efficient use of Parliament's resources and indeed the government's resources to, to do the necessary preparations. Um. I mean, obviously, if you had such a committee, it, it could potentially create a, a mountain of work for, for, for MSPs. But yeah, I think just getting the right the right balance in this, as we laid out in the legislative consent memorandum, and procedures that are that are pragmatic but are, but do recognise the need for proper scrutiny, and that getting that balance, I think, is what the, the clerks and us will be will be searching for, and the, the necessary level of trust between the all 
institutions as well. So, and that's that's the range of proposals that we will want to produce with our our opposite numbers, as I say. Could so, I perhaps say, Camilla, that no yeah. matter what happens, there will be a mountain of work in this. <laughs> you know, I don't think that's going to be avoidable. No, we're, we're aware of that. Um, but obviously, we want uh, uh, the, the right degree of parliamentary scrutiny, uh, yes. so that ministers aren't accused of, shall we say, a power grab. Oh, indeed. Well, I have to say we have no desire in that regard because you know we don't want to be in this position to start with. Right. Okay. Um, I'll move on to Monica Lennon. Thank you. Uh, good morning. The committee has heard from stakeholders about the need for. Um, early engagement on consultative drafts of regulations to be made under the bill, the importance of stakeholders and of course the Parliament in having opportunities to propose amendments to draft legislation has been emphasised to us. Um, Minister, you've already um, put on record that you're open-minded about, um, about scrutiny. So I wonder if you consider that there is scope for strengthening scrutiny in some areas along the lines of a super affirmative procedure? Well, I, I'm, I'm open to any suggestions and the discussions that, you know, taking place between officials on both sides will be helpful. Um, I think the one thing I would caution is that we, we're, there's going to be a time scale for this that has to be met. So if we have super affirmative procedures which take longer, then we may find ourselves with difficulty with the time scale. I, I'm certainly not against in any sense that a wider involvement from stakeholders in this process. You know, one of the virtues of this parliament is the ability to bring in uh, people to give evidence and information that can allow informed decisions, pre-legislative decisions, to be made very often. So uh, we're at our best when that happens. So let's try and make sure that that happens. But if we tied ourselves too much to lengthy procedures, then we would lose both the necessity of this bill, because this is being discussed because it has to be done in a short, shortage period of time, and might, we might find ourselves in a difficult position at the back end. So if you're not in favour of the super affirmative procedure, um, how do you intend to address some of these concerns? I think they'll come from the discussions that are taking place. I, I think that has, we have to bear in mind the necessity of ensuring stakeholder and informed involvement in the decisions that are being made. So you know, I, I, I'm you know, not usually charging Gerald with doing things in the middle of a meeting, but I'm absolutely <laughs> sure Gerald, in, in his discussions with the Parliament, will make sure that those points are borne in mind. Indeed. Do you want to say anything about that? No, I think the, the question of stakeholder engagement in the preparation of instruments is a wider one as well. Um, and we would want to ensure that, that the, the Parliament was able to engage with stakeholders in, in drafts of instruments as much as the government, I'm sure, in, in looking at the options that we have. But I, I, as the Minister says, it would be one of the issues that I think we will be considering in bringing forward proposals with our, our clerking colleagues um, to, to conveners and to ministers. Um, to satisfy the scrutiny requirements um, that Parliament has, balanced, as we say, with the need for progress and, and uh, 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 recognising the volume, as the Minister has pointed out, in relation to, to formal procedures. Thank you. These proposals? I believe we're meeting again on Friday amongst the, 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 the officials, so um, we, will, we need to make early progress. We're very clear about that. Um, thank you. Look forward to getting updates on that. Um, I'm sure you'll agree that the quality of supporting information on instruments will be crucial to effective and efficient scrutiny. What information, Minister, do you expect to provide in support of instruments? Well, we already have a, a good system in Scotland that we provide additional information with every uh, instrument. Um, I am absolutely open to seeing if more information is required. It may well be that... Um, <laughs> there may be further information required, for example, and I'm only using this as an example, a statement of appropriateness or necessity, which actually says you know, why this is being done. And very briefly, it might be a very helpful thing to make sure that everyone has. So there is at least an, additional, uh, an initial check that this is being done for the right reasons. I'm absolutely open to that. It has to be part of this discussion about how things are done, but whatever is needed. Thank you. I, mean, I think that kind of statement would be would be very helpful. Um, in terms of providing that information, would that be at the point of laying the instrument before the Parliament? Is that a commitment? That you I would have give? thought so. I would have okay. thought so. I mean, I think it's difficult to speculate before an instrument is laid. So I think the informa information coming in a package with the instrument, mm -hmm. uh, with, with the uh, explanatory, the, the, the additional note that exists, um, and 
the statement which may or may not be necessary would come with it. One could also use those statements as a, a checklist to make sure that we know what's been in and why it's been in. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> and a couple of ideas that we had listening to, to stakeholders was that you know, that could include an explanation of the existing EU law, mm -hmm. the reasons for um, and the effect of the proposed change, but also a summary of the consultations that have been carried out. Again, is that something that you would yeah, be open I, to? Yeah, I, I think we should make sure that people have as much information we can give them within the timescale needed. I think this idea of a statement of appropriateness or a statement of necessity could contain all that information so that we, we know why it's there, we know what it's trying to correct, and if there are other people that should have been or are involved in it, then that should say so. But I'd like it to be quite brief. We are going to have um, piles of paper as it is, so I think we should have it as brief and concise as possible. Thank you. That's helpful. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister. Um, on the sheer scale of your project, what information can the Minister give to the Committee about the work the Scottish Government is undertaking to prepare the anticipated volume of secondary leg legislation required in relation to the UK's departure from the EU? Well, I'm working very closely with the Minister for Parliamentary Business to make sure that, that we have a, 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 an integrated legislative programme. We're not, despite the mountains of work that's going to come, that these mountains are at least, you know, not too scary. So we're trying to get that all together. Well, we, officials across the Scottish Government in each portfolio are working to identify the secondary legislation that we'll need to consider over the next two years, well, next 18 months in actual fact. We need better information sharing from the UK Government. I, you know, and I say this regularly, we're not having enough information sharing from the UK government. If we get better information sharing, this would help us, because at the end of the day, this is going to depend on uh, what the process is that's being adopted at Westminster, because some of this will depend on what Westminster is going to do. But, you know, we're working on it. Um, how will the Scottish Government work with the Parliament and the committees tasked with the scrutiny of the legislation to keep them informed? Well, I've indicated to, to Monica Lennon some of the, the documentation. Uh, we obviously want to let you know and the Parliament know as soon as possible what the anticipated volume is and then to break that volume down. I, I know that the Minister for Parliamentary Business is due to give evidence to you later in the year. I would have hoped that he might be in a position then to let you know and because we're working on it presently and I'm quite happy to make a commitment to keep you informed as this develops. The committee has heard from witnesses about the importance of the UK ministers and the Scottish ministers and the respective officials working together on the handling of secondary legislation project, in particular given the potential for overlap and the sequencing of issues involved. Is there a cross-administration steering group? And if so, will the Scottish Government provide a commitment to keep the Parliament updated on the progress and decisions of that steering group? Well, we already have the JMC, which is essentially what you're talking about. The JMC structure is meant to cope with that. The JMC structure consists of a plenary of the First Minister and the, of the Prime Minister and the First Ministers and other ministers as required. There's a sort of side shoot of it, JMC Europe, which deals with the uh, upcoming European Council. Every time there's a European Council, JMC Europe is meant to meet two or three weeks beforehand to look at the agenda. It's a sort of clearinghouse. There's a JMC EN, the, the new part that was established last year, which is European Negotiations, which is the meeting that was held last week. We hadn't met for eight months. But underpinning it is the JMCO, which is the officials group. Now, the officials group has lots and lots of different strands to it, and they meet and talk about these matters. So there is considerable work being done. However, I stress that until we get agreement on the bill, until we get agreement on Clause 11 particularly, we're not in a position to take a lot of things forward because we don't agree with the way in which things are going and we can't agree to set up frameworks until we have an agreement of what those frameworks are going to be like. So there's been a slight hiatus in that, but there is discussion going on about the, these issues in terms of the detail of the bill, and those will continue. And officials will bring that information to ministers, I presume to UK ministers as well as to Scottish ministers, and we will react accordingly. When we know things, we'll let the committee know. I mean, you know, there's no interest, we have no interest in hoarding that information because we recognise that the burden is going to fall on committees. So that's where we will go. Thank you. So I guess the upshot of all this is we want to get to a point where the Scottish Parliament uh, can agree the legislative consent motion and, and the Welsh Assembly uh, so everyone can agree to this. How confident are you that we'll get there? I don't know, presently. 
uh, there's a clear route to it, which is for the UK government to change the uh, EU withdrawal bill, to remove Clause 11, and to accept the amendments that we have put forward with the Welsh. In those circumstances, we can get there. If that does not happen, then we will not bring forward a legislative consent motion. That's where we are. Um, we are talking. You know, I've met, uh, John Swinney and I have met with Damien Green and David Mundell twice. Um, I've spoken on the phone separately to Damien, Damien Green and to David Davis, clearly. Um, there's now been a meeting of the JMCEN. We're promised another one before Christmas. The bill is uh, moving more slowly than had it been anticipated. It's not, I think, due now in the Commons probably until after the November recess in the Commons. There's a week in November that they're off, so the 13th of November is about the earliest date it will come in. It's going to be very tight to get that bill through before Christmas, um, which is what their stated intention was. But, you know, we have time to resolve this because we don't have to bring a legislative consent motion until the last amending stage of the bill, and that's a House of Lords um, final stage. And that, we thought, would be in January, but it's likely to be later now, it could be in February, so we've got until then to resolve this. If we can get this resolved, then we can bring that legislative consent motion. If not, we can't. Okay. Um, obviously, a lot, a lot of amendments. Uh, I haven't seen them. You, you probably have, um, but um, presume some of them deal with the points that you've been making. Uh, well, it, it, let me just define clearly what we're talking about here. There's the joint ones between the Welsh and the Scottish governments. Uh, you know, those are the ones we're interested in. Those are the ones, if passed, uh, or equivalents passed, we will bring forward the motion. That's been clear. However, um, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of other amendments on a whole range of things. Uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights, for example, which I profoundly agree with. But we've been clear in our scope. So there's a range of amendments I'd be delighted to see passed, uh, but you know, as far as we're concerned, it's the Welsh and Scottish ones that we're focused on. Just out of interest, your, your amendments and the Welsh amendments, who submits those? They have been tabled. They were tabled by a group of MPs, uh, Labour, um, representing Labour, SNP, Plaid, Liberals, uh, Greens, uh, have all been involved in, in tabling them. Uh, so it's a cross-party activity. And I was pleased to see uh, Keir Starmer at the weekend identifying the six key issues in the bill, one of which was the devolved uh, parliaments and their uh, rights. And therefore, therefore, clearly, those amendments have the backing of the parliamentary parties that I'm talking about. Okay. Um, and you'll be aware, because there was a statement last week, uh, that there was a committee um, set up, um, actually... By, by the Lords um, of parliamentarians, including myself, uh, from uh, across the, the, the four nations, um, who are essentially saying we want to get to that point where we can agree that L LCM. And I, I'm pleased that that's the case, and I think if um, those who have influence with the current UK government can bring that influence to bear, then all the better. Thank you very much. Uh, any members, any other questions? Okay. Can I thank you very thank much you. for your time? We'll suspend briefly to uh, allow a change of the witnesses.
Right, we'll start again. Um, so our next panel uh, this morning was arranged at very short notice, and I, I kind of thank the witnesses for uh, attending today. Um, we've got before us uh, Daphne <coughs> Vlastari, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, um, Advocacy Manager from Scottish Environment Link, and Isabel Mercer, Policy Officer from the RSPB. So welcome to you. Um, can I ask you um, initially just to uh, generally give us your thoughts on the bill? And um, yeah, so um, I guess firstly we'd just like to thank the convener for inviting us to give evidence today. Um, and um, then I think it's kind of important to say both RSPB Scotland and Scottish Environment Link and, and other members of Scottish Environment Link we're all coming at this from an environmental outcomes perspective. So we're obviously primarily interested in um, ensuring that all of the current protections that are provided to the natural environment by EU legislation and institutions will remain. Um, and that all that legis legislation will be brought over and there will be no gaps in the protections currently provided to the environment. Um, so when we're looking at the withdrawal bill, we've been looking at three principal points. Um, to do with that and one of them is ensuring that um, environmental principles are brought over alongside the entire body of EU environmental acquis. Um, so EU environmental law is underpinned by a number of key um, international uh, principles of international environmental law such as the precautionary principle and um, the polluter pays principle, principle of sustainable development and they play a key role in how uh, EU environmental law is interpreted both in the court system and also um, how e EU environmental legislation is developed. So all EU legislation is developed on the basis of those principles. Um, those principles are outlined in the EU treaties, but they're not currently um, spelled out in any of the directives and they're not articulated in domestic law. And at present, the withdrawal bill does not make it clear whether those principles will be brought over. So that's one of our kind of key issues that we're interested in. Um, shall I pass over to you too? Um, so indeed, thanks for having us. Isabel, I think, outlined very clearly what some of our um, concerns are with regards to the bill. We see the necessity of it, but at the same time, there are some gaps that need to be addressed. The aspect of um, EU law that needs to be converted into domestic law is obviously very important. And retained EU law, as it will now be called, needs to have the status of primary legislation. Um, the issue of principles is also very important. Um, these are international environmental governance principles that are enshrined in things like climate change treaties, Rio Declaration, Sustainable Development Goals, and the fact that they are in the legal text of the EU treaties has enabled EU law to be based on those principles. As we leave the EU, we will lose those principles that have really formed the bedrock of all environmental, but also consumer health legislation. So we think this is something quite important um, to look into in terms of the bill. The other aspect, and I think um, there was some reference to sort of different bodies and duties, is the fact that we have identified a very important governance gap um, with the sort of exit from the EU. Um, so the EU bodies at the moment perform a variety of um, roles from gathering and monitoring of data, you know, supported by the national agencies, to really, um, you know, recourse to the Commission and the ECJ when we find that um, EU law is not currently implemented. So this has been a very useful leverage to ensure that all governments implement EU law in the best possible way to deliver the environmental outcomes we're looking at. And this, of course, applies to the, you know, the entirety of the EU acquis. So we would be looking to have a discussion um, across the UK about what are the bodies that we would need to ensure that those functions are uh, preserved as we move forward. The third aspect, I think, and this has been, I think, highlighted in the previous section of this committee, um, was the fact 
of scrutiny and stakeholder engagement. Um, I think going forward, if it is about you know the different SIs that will need to be looked at, if it is about the potential UK frameworks that we would be looking to implement, uh, what we would like to see is a clear mandate for um, transparency, scrutiny in terms of the involvement of Parliament, but also substantive stakeholder engagement. And I think there were references to the joint communique earlier today. Um, I think one of the points that really um, we would like to highlight is the fact that there is really no reference to stakeholder engagement. And I think unless we can have a public and transparent dialogue, we will not get at the best legislative outcomes. That is it from us. Thanks. I'm just quickly looking through that <laughs> communique. And, uh, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> there was no reference to... I would hope so. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. my reading skills yeah. are... <laughs> <laughs> um, Stuart, you have got a question. Uh, yes. Um, uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, so in the RSPB um, submission, the final paragraph um, also highlights the issue of the, well, uh, certainly kind of what you discussed there regarding the oversight um, and the lack of clarity in the bill about the status of the retained EU law. And obviously you, you've touched upon that a few moments ago. Uh, and you've also suggested that <clears throat> now the, the, in terms of when the law comes over that it should be done by primary legislation. Um, in your estimation, how many, how many pieces of legislation would that actually be in terms of primary legislation? Well, the estimates that we have is that about 80% of current environmental laws are um, EU laws. Um, obviously, there are some that are already part of the Scottish statute in the forms of directives. There are other which are regulations. Um, I think there was a communication by um, Michael Gove um, to the relevant committee in Westminster that provides some information about the statutory instruments and the amount of, piece of you know, work that would need to be done. Um, we haven't done, um, you know, we haven't collated that evidence ourselves, but I would be happy to forward you. Um, or, you know, that letter, which I assume you already have. Mm. But we are talking about a substantive amount um, of statutory instruments that we would have to look into. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, mean, I, I am very sympathetic to, uh, to your suggestion in terms of uh, the protection uh, of the environmental laws. Uh, I, generally, I'm very sympathetic. Uh, but uh, the, aspect, <coughs> excuse me, the aspect that, uh, that I am aware of is uh, we have this, uh, this this one bill going through the, the, the process at the moment, and it's anticipated about another 13 bills after that, uh, and then certainly for this parliament, potentially up to about 300 uh, pieces of uh, secondary legislation. Uh, and if yourselves are suggesting that environmental legislation should be primary and not secondary, then that would be over and above, I would imagine. Yes. Uh, what's already been discussed. So let me clarify, perhaps I was unclear. I think we're looking to ensure that the EU retained law that is part of our domestic system has is given the status of primary law so that it cannot be changed by secondary legislation in the future. So that we, let's say if we decide uh, that there's a need to change something about environmental protections, that this would need to go through the full process of parliamentary procedure um, rather than be amended um, kind of without any scrutiny. So we're not seeking to kind of pass by primary legislation all pieces of EU law, but rather to grant them the status of primary legislation and the mm. same securities that come with that. Mm. Okay. Um, okay, so in terms of uh, in terms of that then, um, what uh, well, well, how many uh, how many pieces of legislation would you expect that to be? Again, we don't have a firm number, as you probably know very well. Uh, the majority of EU environmental mm. law is you know it's about eighty percent rather of yeah. environmental law it comes at EU. This is a complex um, sort of matrix of directives, regulations, and other decisions. Uh, so it's a bit hard to give this a number. Uh, as I said before, the approximate estimates that about 80% of our yeah. legal um, sort of texts come from mm. the EU when it comes to environment. Sure. So I guess just to kind of emphasize the, the key point is more just we're interested in the future safeguarding of yeah. those pieces of legislation, making sure that you know any future government isn't left able to make changes to secondary legislation, which could then have far-reaching implications for the environment. Uh, in terms of, uh, my final question on this area, in terms of that, uh, would, you, uh, would you accept 
um, we can have an interim position whereby, uh, in order to get the, the legislation transposed over firstly, uh, and then with maybe kind of a, a, a period of time, just for talking's sake, or within a five-year period of time, then anything that has been transposed over in terms of secondary legislation would then uh, go into uh, kind of a primary legislation uh, aspect. Would that be something that, uh, that, uh, that you would consider or, or, or accept? I think we would need to perhaps get some legal clarity um, on this and what are the, the possibilities, because um, the withdrawal bill aims to bring over all mm. EU law. Um, obviously, if the withdrawal bill itself includes clauses, that means that we can amend with very limited scrutiny the content of that EU retained law. That means that we're opening ourselves to a lot of potential changes, mm. intentional and unintentional. Mm. Um, so I think our point is that to meet the uh, goal of the bill, the withdrawal bill, which is to keep the protections when it comes to environment, the environmental protections, then we need to ensure that EU retained law is given the status of primary legislation. Um, to our understanding, this doesn't mean that we, sorry, that we have to sort of pass again legislation to give it that status, but perhaps that is a point that we can get some legal clarity on in terms of the possibilities. Yeah. I do want to stress, I am genuinely sympathetic to yeah. obviously what it is that you're suggesting, uh, but I'm also conscious of the, uh, well, I certainly mean, well, the work that goes through uh, this committee uh, and, uh, and the scope of the, uh, uh, what's ahead of us, uh, not just here, but certainly more UK-wide right, in terms of the, this legislation. I think perhaps what we can take back as a point is to come back to the committee on this point just to clarify the implications of that request, also in terms of the workload, so we can come back to you with a sort of sure. more precise response. Okay, that would be helpful. Thank you. Do, you. do you have a fear in, in this process that uh, some of the environmental laws that you, you, you cherish um, could, could be lost? So, yeah, I mean, obviously in any sector at the moment, there, there's a worry that there will be gaps in the regulations that are brought over. And as we've kind of laid out already, our main concern is to ensure that the entire body of EU environmental legislation, including those underpinning principles, is brought over. Because were it not to be brought over in its entirety, there could be far-reaching consequences of the environment, as you've just indicated. Um, and that's why we feel, in particular, that the, the issues to do with scrutiny and stakeholder engagement are particularly key um, to ensure that... So, so I think one of the areas we're quite concerned about is this issue of technical and non-technical changes and that there's not necessarily... Um, there's not a good definition of what would, be, what would constitute a technical change. We do not feel that that definition is there at the moment. Mm. Um, and that, that there needs to be much more clarity about the types of changes that are going to be carried out. So for instance, in the explanatory notes to the bill, um, the, one of the technical changes that they kind of use as an illustrative point is the removal of a reporting requirement. Um, and rather than transferring that reporting requirement to a, a, a UK public authority or body, they've just suggested that the, the requirement be removed altogether. And if that, for instance, was a requirement to report or monitor um, on an the status of the environment in some way, for instance, air quality or um, the trends in species and habitats populations, and that, that requirement was removed, that would go far beyond what we would consider to be a technical change. Whereas at the moment, the bill suggests that those kinds of changes would go through without what we would consider to be an appropriate level of parliamentary scrutiny and stakeholder engagement. Mm. I think the other aspect to highlight is, you know, you mentioned policies and pieces of legislation. Of course, um, you know, recent sort of um, data has suggested that an overwhelming majority of the UK population do not want to see these EU laws lost in any way. And in fact, I think um, there was great support from citizens across the UK for the Birds and Habitats Directive refit that was only recently closed at the EU level. But I think apart from uh, the text of the legislation, the directives, the regulations, I think we're also very concerned about the loss of functions of EU bodies. So monitoring, collecting the data and comparing that um, is one aspect, which is rather mundane and technical, but very important for actually measuring process. But also the other aspect is the implementation and enforcement of EU legislation. 
Um, so there's been, I think there's been an acceptance from the UK government um, by Mr. Gove regarding the fact that there is such a governance gap, as it has now been called. And I think what we're looking to do is to develop different solutions for that. Um, again, I think the um, legal system in the UK um, and Scotland um, doesn't allow for those functions of the Commission and the ECJ to be replicated quite in the same way. So we would be looking to see what the potential solutions to that are, if that involves you know, giving existing bodies new functions or actually creating new bodies to address that. Um, Sorry, what, yes. what sort of bodies uh, are you talking about so, at, at EU level that so would have instance, to be replicated here? The ECJ, for instance, um, has been kind of the guardian of the EU laws in terms of ensuring that there's proper implementation and being able to enforce that at a member state level. Um, this has meant that when civil society, businesses, citizens felt that some piece of EU legislation was not adequately implemented, they had recourse to the European Commission to address that. <coughs> through bilateral discussions with different public bodies of that member state concern, they would seek to understand whether actually there was an issue and of course you know if you take that towards you know the entire process that does mean then involving the ECJ um, so I guess what we are very concerned about is who will be the guardian of the EU retained law um, and I think our concern is that parliamentary scrutiny process or the existing um, space that is provided by the UK and Scottish legal systems don't quite replicate in the same way the functions of the Commission and the ECJ. And practically, so how, practically how, how, what would that mean? So I think um, the environmental sector is looking at different options and this is something that we're doing with colleagues across the UK, so it's not a Scottish only exercise. Um, so there's a variety of potential solutions um, and I think we wouldn't be looking for a silver bullet, I think it would be different functions going to different bodies perhaps that could help it out. But I think we're looking potentially at an environmental commissioner or ombudsman um, potentially for helping with issues on access to justice, um, environmental courts, which would mean that we um, can address issues in a more affordable way with the relevant expertise. Um, and of course, that would be in addition to the kind of current you know, parliamentary scrutiny and accountability, accountability mechanisms that we have in place. And do, do, and do you think this uh, commissioner and courts would exist at a UK level or would it be Scottish level? I think that, well, just to take a step back, I think Scottish Environment Link and other environmental NGOs have been calling for environmental courts in Scotland for quite some time. Um, so there is scope to have that at Scottish level. Um, however, I think the final constellation of whether we're talking about UK bodies or, um, you know, bodies set up at a devolved level will really depend on how the withdrawal bill progresses and the, you know how the different competences are set. I think what we would like to see is for all governments, regardless of level, to be held accountable in the same way on an equal footing. Okay. Did you want in? Uh, I was, well, I suppose just to build on Daphne's point a bit that Scottish Environment Link members have been calling for environmental courts for a very long time and it's worth kind of just mentioning that these governance issues do already exist to some extent with our current domestic arrangements and there are gaps, um, for instance, in access to justice on the environment and there was an, a consultation on environmental justice carried out last year by the Scottish Government. Um, so it's kind of worth flagging that because these issues do already exist, they're going to be exacerbated much more through the loss then of EU institutions and oversight mechanisms. Um, so as kind of Daphne's outlined, there will be instances where in Scotland, particular to the Scottish judicial and parliamentary system, there might be areas where we've already outlined the gaps and those gaps could be filled and there might be instances where there's a larger problem caused by the loss of EU oversight and accountability mechanisms that might necessitate a, a UK type governance arrangement. Um, we've heard from witnesses, including yourselves, um, that there are problems with the breadth of the powers uh, in the bill, and in particular the wide reach of the term deficiencies. Mm. Um, so can you explain why you think the powers are too wide, and how you think the powers could be improved, and do you consider 
Uh, the reference to what is considered appropriate means that the powers are too broadly drawn. You'll recall the evidence previously this morning. Yeah, so um, as, as you've already mentioned, quite a few of these points have already been made today, but just to reiterate, um, from RSPB Scotland and Scottish Environment Link point of view, um, our three main concerns with the scope of the powers have been the definition of what constitutes technical or non-technical change, the um, fact that um, the definition of deficiency is not appropriately limited and is extremely broad at present, and the fact that the bill leaves open changes that Minister considers appropriate, um, which we are quite concerned, um, given that the, Scottish, uh, the, the UK government has given it reassurances that the bill will only be making what they consider to be technical amendments to ensure that um, e that the law continues to operate on e on exit day. However, as those three issues that I've just outlined essentially leave leave it open so that those powers could be exercised in a way which do um, create substantive policy changes. That's our view. Um, and so, as we've kind of outlined already, we believe that any non-technical changes that are made, so what we might consider substantive policy decisions, should be only made by primary legislation. And in order for those to be identified, um, as has already been kind of suggested today, there might be some sort of sift and scrutinise mechanism that's put in place so that different statutory instruments can be um, sifted through and it can be identified where some where they are just a technical change and where they may be a non-technical change and in those instances where there might be a, a non-technical change they could be given increased scrutiny Do you want to um, we've got some questions on devolved authorities powers i wonder if one of the members would like to take that perhaps yourself bill a different question if, sure. you, if you don't mind um, and just listening to what you were saying are you saying that the the EU law that is now here and this now will be transferred into UK law, and I'm presuming we're not really speaking about Scotland here, we're talking about the general you know, UK law, can't operate without scrutiny, of, you know, without having these um, um, European bodies in, in place? I think what we were saying that for it to be operating on the same level as it does today, you need to also replicate the mechanisms of enforcement and monitoring that are currently exercised at an EU level through EU bodies. Um, I think you know copy pasting the text, uh, if you like, is is well it exists as it does does at the moment in effect, doesn't it? Well, it also relies on a lot of EU bodies carrying functions. Um, I think this is why there's a relevant clause in um, the withdrawal bill um, about assigning functions currently exercised by EU bodies to new or existing bodies. And I think that actually hints at the fact that there is a bit of a governance gap there. However, that power also allows them to abolish or remove those functions entirely which is obviously something that we might be quite concerned about if some of those functions were being proposed to be removed. So if it might help to give an example of the type of functions that we're talking about, um, obviously something that's been had quite high profile in the media is air pollution, air quality regulations, um, and Client Earth has twice taken legal action against the UK government through the EU institutions in order to ensure that they do withhold their commitments under the EU legislation. Um, and so one thing that we are quite concerned about at the, at the end of the scale of looking at enforcement and compliance and at the other end of the scale is things like monitoring and reporting. But if you're talking about enforcement and compliance, there will be a gap when you're looking at how the executive is held to account on its commitments because there won't, we'll be losing things like the um, mechanism of the EU Commission for citizens and organisations in the EU to bring free complaints forward. There isn't really a, a mechanism that exists in Scotland or in the UK as a whole, um, a kind of forum where NGOs like ourselves or individuals could bring a complaint about uh, the executive not withholding, not standing up to environmental commitments. I thought it was the UK courts that took the government to task on the air quality. It, it was uh, European, so it was done through the UK courts, but using the European legal system. And you say you want to replicate, so you would put the exact same um, procedures. It was, I think, um, Daphne Lasalle who said 
I think we're looking to ensure that the functions that are useful and um, you know have been helping us actually improve our um, environment, but also in terms of public safety, because really these things apply to a wide variety of kind of sectoral legislation. But I think what we'll be looking to do is uh, try and see where we can replicate some of the functions. Uh, we're not saying you know bring this everything back to the UK or the Scottish level. I thought level. that was what you said. Um, we would like to see how the, those functions can be replicated at a domestic level um, and whether existing agencies such as CEPA or SNH for instance could take some of the um, you know responsibilities carried out at the moment by EU bodies uh, whether other bodies would be needed to carry out some other functions um, I think what we are doing right now is highlighting that there is an important governance gap a gap that has been acknowledged also by the UK government and I think what we need is to look into the potential solutions to ensure that you know, we will have a functioning statute book as of the date of exit. Okay. Um, so who would like to take questions on devolved okay. authorities' powers? Just I come in on that point of scrutiny. Sure. Um, in your evidence that you, you've given that you're calling for a robust scrutiny system and more engagement with stakeholders, um, so would you consider that a scope for strengthening scrutiny in some areas and the lines of a super affirmative process, by which I mean consultation period in a draft order before the order is laid before the Parliament and subject to approval. So I think that would be one of the options. Um, as you can appreciate, we would be looking to maximise the potential for stakeholder engagement. I think this means um, sort of maximising the time that the committee has, any committee has, to look into the instruments that are being laid before it, um, opportunity to, um, you know, just as we've done today, you know, bring stakeholders to engage with them, ask them questions, provide evidence, equally, you know, um, be able to uh, call on ministers to come in and provide evidence, and also the possibility for that committee that would be looking at the relevant um, uh, documents uh, to be able to recommend to ministers to relay with recommendations taken into account from that committee. Um, so these are some of the sort of issues and points that we would like to see um, forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on that, on scrutiny, David? No. Stuart? I can do that. Sure. No, okay. Thank you. Right, it's uh, certainly that the committee uh, notes that uh, the Scottish ministers have no uh, power under the bill to modify retained direct EU legislation, and it's been suggested in evidence that uh, it would be that would give rise to legal uncertainty if four sets of governments in the UK uh, were able to modify retained direct EU legislation. Uh, for example, it would make it very difficult to identify uh, what retained EU law was, uh, with a potentially detrimental effect uh, on the continuity which the, the bill aims to provide for. Uh, so what uh, is your response to that particular argument and also the power in part one of schedule two that enables the, the Scottish ministers to make uh, changes to retained EU law, which is EU derived domestic law? Uh, are there restrictions on ministers' ability uh, to revisit uh, those changes later and make further changes? So um, I think that's a long question, so I might ask you to repeat some of parts of it. Okay. But, um, I think just generally our starting point is that uh, this is a very unique um, um, process that we're going through. It's never been attempted, so obviously we're identifying issues that are, as they're coming up. Um, our starting point, however, is that we want the devolution agreement to be fully respected. Um, and that we want that any um, policies coming forward to be jointly developed and agreed. Um, this is just something that we think is very important in terms of ensuring environmental outcomes. Uh, we feel that when governments have a stake and invested in a policy process, then it makes them all the more likely to be successful and well implemented in the future, which is really where we are coming from at this point. So I hope that was helpful. So, uh, so I think that certainly, uh, I would suggest, kind of goes back to what we heard earlier from the Minister regarding the Clause 11 mm -hmm. um, discussion, uh, and obviously the amendments that have been placed down at the, the House of Commons. Uh, I, I would assume that you're obviously lobbying the, the, rel uh, the MPs and, uh, and UK government uh, on uh, in this particular area as well. Yeah, so um, RSPB and, well, uh, Scottish Environment Link and the other environment links in the UK were all part of a Greener UK coalition of environmental NGOs. 
Um, so it's through through that organisation that we've been doing most of our engagement with MPs, um, and we will be, um, we have been calling for um, any common frameworks that are agreed on environmental matters to be jointly agreed between all four countries, jointly developed and agreed, because as Daphne has outlined, we feel that that's most likely to lead to uh, the most beneficial environmental outcomes. Legislation is more likely to run smoothly if it has been jointly agreed and negotiated rather than imposed. That's our view. Right. I mean, certainly, I mean, uh, are there any powers available to the UK ministers uh, under the, the bill that, uh, that you should think that uh, would also be available to Scottish ministers? So I think our position is that we don't feel there's enough clarity provided in the bill about where Scottish ministers and the Scottish Parliament are expected to play a role and where they will be expected to create statutory instruments. So as you kind of already outlined, there's issues around um, certain types of retained EU law, like EU regulations, and whether Scottish ministers will be expected to create statutory instruments to amend deficiencies in that type of retained EU law. Um, so we're calling more generally for more clarity um, on where the Scottish ministers and Scottish Parliament are expected to play a role. And then, again, going back to our kind of headline points, any delegated powers under the bill need to be subject to an appropriate level of scrutiny. Um, that's kind of where we're coming from. Okay. Uh, I mean, certainly, it's, uh, I mean, there is no procedure which allows the Scottish ministers to, to make regulations urgently. And also we heard about that from the minister earlier on. And although there is uh, such a procedure available to the UK ministers, uh, do you think this is something that, uh, that could cause problems for ensuring uh, the continuity of, uh, of law and environmental law? Uh, and if so, what would you like to see happen? I think if the minister was unable to provide with a very concrete answer, I think it would be unfair for us to, ex to expect us to provide mm. one. Um, I don't think that this has come up as, as an issue. I think our general concern is to do with the level of scrutiny and stakeholder engagement um, that we would want to have going forward as regards statutory instruments. Um, there is one specific aspect that does link back to the issue of um, the governance gap. Um, we've identified, I think, in Clause 7.5 uh, that the bill gives ministers powers to assign functions currently exercised by EU bodies, um, but there's no obligation to do so. Isabel uh, mentioned that um, there needs to be an obligation to do so, and we need the equivalent powers to be conferred onto Scottish ministers, so the same can be done at the Scottish level. So this is one quite specific but important point to be taken forward. Are there any other uh, points you would like to, any other uh, areas of, of a governance gap you'd like to highlight? Without uh, providing really, um, I think, any, any type of solution, um, I think it is quite important to um, um, sort of take into account the sort of open-ended um, and far-reaching powers of the, the, de the delegated powers that are conferred. I think we're particularly worried about some of the powers that would enable ministers to actually make changes to the withdrawal bill itself. Um, I think there needs to be some sort of level of confidence and certainty about the clauses and the status of the EU retained law going forward. Um, the other aspect I think that we are not entirely clear at the moment is um, there are references where there is um, uh, sort of the UK and Scottish ministers would be jointly, um, you know, acting jointly. And I think we would want to see a bit more certainty about how this process would actually uh, be delivered, uh, what would be, if any, the role of the Scottish Parliament. And again, going at those really basic principles of, you know, uh, decision making and, and how this functions in terms of transparency and stakeholder engagement. Um, and again, we mentioned earlier the aspect of UK frameworks. Um, there are provisions um, in the withdrawal bill about how some of the powers can be redevolved, if you like, at the Scottish level. Um, I think there is um, no real clarity about how this process um, will be taken forward, what will be the involvement of the different governments and administrations and parliaments. And I think um, to move forward in, a, in a, as constructive a, a way possible, uh, we would need to see that uh, more clearly laid out. Yeah. I mean, just, just on that, uh, that one point, you mentioned there in terms of the, the joint uh, approach, uh, and obviously we had that discussion earlier regarding either the Scottish ministers or a joint or UK ministers uh, taking the decision uh, here. Um, what, uh, what aspect or what factors uh, would you consider uh, should actually be the determining uh, reasons uh, for the choice of route to be uh, to be uh, utilised. 
uh, out of these three. So I'm not sure we would have um, a very concrete solution to this. Um, obviously, the withdrawal bill has some quite specific provisions about how things could be carried forward. I think as far as we are concerned is that we want to ensure that environmental protections and the legislation that support them are taken forward um, and that looking into future legislation, we're in the best position possible to actually deliver on all the ambitious um, targets in terms of biodiversity loss, resource efficiency and climate change um, that the Scottish Government has committed to. Any other members want in? Just sticking to um, scrutiny, um, you know, the Parliament is going to have a big job to do, we all know that, and it's going to be important to, to prioritise um, our work. Um, do you have any suggestions about what the Parliament should be focusing on, and do you have a view on there being a sifting committee? We, we raised that earlier with the Minister. We're very pleased to hear um, from the Minister that, that that's something that they're considering and it is something that both Green UK and ourselves and Env Scottish Environment Link have all suggested um, as an option, as a kind of time-limited parliamentary committee um, that would be able to sift through those uh, statutory instruments and, as kind of Daphne already um, said earlier, to either ask stakeholders or the Minister to come and provide further evidence on that instrument or... Um, to recommend substantive changes to the instrument if that was felt necessary. Um, and so that's something we definitely support. Yeah, nothing to add. And just a point that you'd made, I was quite interested in, um, you said that the Scottish Environment Link have been calling for an environmental court in Scotland for some years. Um, you know, Given the importance of what you've set out today, are there other things that the Scottish Government could do now in the short term to... Um, I suppose put a focus on on environmental protection and some of the the, the issues that you've raised. Um, I think you talked about environment commissioner or you know the court as well. So are there things that the government could do now, in your opinion? Yes. So obviously the fact that we have a bit of a closed door in environmental courts, um, even though that is not a hundred percent closed door. Um, uh, is is not something that we think can help the sort of the conversation go forward. Um, as far as we are concerned, we would like to see kind of an open debate about how this governance gap can be addressed. Um, you know, there is a lot of good work that is being done, I think, in the First Minister's Standing Council for Europe. Uh, so perhaps this could be a topic that is taken forward within that context. There's an environmental subgroup. Um, obviously, this is also an issue that perhaps the Scottish Parliament and some of its committees can look into um, in terms of what are the, the possibilities, what will be the uh, positives and negatives of different solutions. Um, we are working with some academics um, to try and suss those things out. I think another aspect that would be quite important for the for the government to take forward, and I appreciate what the minister said earlier about um, their focus being really on the Scottish and Welsh amendments, um, but the Scottish government and Scotland has traditionally um, made a lot of use of these environmental principles, as we mentioned earlier, when it comes to the precautionary principle mm -hmm. and pool to pays. Um, I think it would only be fitting for the Scottish government to actually support the maintaining of those principles at the UK level, but definitely at the Scottish level as well, and make that a key uh, argument in their position. Okay, thank you. Oh, just briefly then, are they doing that strong enough at the moment, again, in your view? I, I think... Um, stronger would be better. Um, obviously, I think we've heard from um, Rosanna Cunningham, the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and um, Land Reform, that there will be no um, turning the clock on environmental protections, which is very important, that we would want to continue um, looking at what the EU is doing in terms of environmental protections and law and emulate that where it is applicable and where it makes sense. Uh, and I think uh, Minister Michael Russell has made similar commitments. Um, I think this, this is a fantastic starting point. I think now we're though getting to the point in the negotiations where we need to start fleshing out what these commitments towards environmental protection and consumer health actually mean in concrete, almost legislative terms. Um, and I think that would be quite important going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other members? Okay, um, I'd like to thank you very much for your time uh, this morning and uh, we'll suspend the meeting briefly. Thank you.
Right, uh, we'll move on to agenda item form for instruments subject to affirmative procedure. Uh, so the next item is consideration of those instruments. Uh, no points have been raised by our legal advisers on the draft telecommunications restriction orders, custodial institutions, Scotland regulations 2017, the draft budget Scotland Act 2017 amendment regulations 2017, the draft pollution prevention and control Scotland amendment regulations 2017, and the draft fishing vessels and fish farming Miscellaneous Revocations Scotland Scheme 2017. Is the committee content with these instruments? Okay. Agenda item five, instruments subject to negative procedure. So Common Agricultural Policy, Direct Payments, etc. Scotland Amendment number two, Regulations 2017. SSI 2017-317. The regulations amend the Common Agricultural Policy uh, Direct Payments, etc. Scotland Regulations 2015. The amendments make provision to extend the deadline for relevant applications under the Voluntary Coupled Support Scheme for ovine animals. The regulations were laid before the Parliament on September the 28th and come into force on October the 9th. They do not respect the requirement that at least 28 days should elapse between the laying of an instrument which is subject to the negative procedure uh, and the coming into force of that instrument as required by Section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010. As regards its interest in the Scottish Government's decision to proceed in this manner, the Committee may wish to find that the failure to comply with Section 28.2 to be acceptable in the circumstances. The reasons for doing so are outlined by the Scottish Government Agriculture and Rural Economy Directorate in its letter to the presiding officer dated September the 28th. Uh, does the committee agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament under reporting ground J as the instrument fails to comply with the requirements of section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010? Good. Public and private water supplies, miscellaneous amendments, Scotland regulations, 2017 SSI, 2017-321. The instrument corrects errors in two earlier instruments, the Public Water Supply Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 and the Water Intended for Human Consumption Private Supplies Scotland Regulations 2017. It fulfils an undertaking given by the Scottish Government to correct errors in these instruments at the earliest opportunity. Mm -hmm. The regulations were laid before Parliament on October the 3rd and came, come into force on October the 26th. They do not respect the requirement that at least 28 days should elapse between the laying of an instrument which is subject to the negative procedure and the coming into force of that instrument as required by Section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010. The Committee may wish to find the failure to comply with Section 28.2 to be acceptable in the circumstances. The Scottish Government's Energy and Climate Change Directorate has outlined the reasons for the breach in its letter to the presiding officer dated October the 3rd. Does the committee agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament under reporting ground J because the instrument fails to comply with the requirements of Section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010. Thank you. Uh, no points have been raised by our legal advisers on SSI's 2017, 323, 324, 325 and 329. Is the committee content with these instruments? Content. Agenda item six, instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on SSI's 2017, 322, 330 and 332. 
Is the committee content with these instruments? Content. Okay. Agenda <laughs> item seven, Child Poverty Scotland Bill. We've got a paper before us that considers the delegated powers contained in the bill following amendments made at stage two. One existing delegated power has been amended in line with the committee's recommendation in its stage one report. As a result, the power to make regulations changing the base date for the absolute poverty target in section three is now subject to the affirmative procedure. This is a higher level of scrutiny than the negative procedure previously included in the bill at introduction. Two new delegated powers have also been added as part of the new schedule to the bill. The paper before us suggests that the scrutiny for the power to make regulations in paragraph 3.2c of the schedule to the bill on access to information should be subject to the affirmative procedure rather than the, the negative procedure as currently provided. Does the committee agree to welcome the Scottish Government uh, has commended Section 3 of the Bill in line with a recommendation in the Committee's Stage 1 report? Okay. Does the Committee agree to report to the Social Security <coughs> Committee along the lines detailed in the paper? Okay. Uh, in particular, is the Committee content to recommend that the power to make regulations in paragraph 3.2c of the schedule to the Bill is amended to be subject to the affirmative procedure rather than the negative procedure. Okay. I now move the committee meeting into private.